Welcome, friends, to Breakfast in the Ruins, a Michael Moorcock flavoured podcast. On this show, Derek, aka Imria, returns to Derry and Tom's to talk about a fellow New Yorker, Robert Sheckley, a writer Moorcock described in 2002 as the most influential absurdist to emerge from 1950s science fiction. Books such as Mind Swap and Dimension of Miracles furnish Douglas Adams with an entire cabinet of borrowed curiosities. Sheckler remains an inspiration for almost every funny SF and fantasy author right in today. And Moorcock even dedicated his Sailing to Utopia collection to Sheckley in the 1990s. Much like Mike himself, sadly, Sheckley is not amongst the household names of SF and fantasy these days, yet his reach is long. Now the day after Derek and I recorded our conversation, I happened to hear of the death of British science fiction author Christopher Priest, a fellow who has had the odd mention on this podcast in the past. And in a strange piece of synchronicity, that same day, I came across an obituary for Robert Sheckley, published by The Guardian, on the 20th of December 2005, written by Christopher Priest. So, instead of straining my arms by pulling a copy of John Clute and Peter Nichols' ginormous encyclopedia of science fiction off the shelf, I'm just going to read that. Obituary, Robert Sheckley. SF's master of short stories, he chronicled a galaxy of conmen and innocence, 50s style. The American writer of sharply observed and witty science fiction Robert Sheckley has died aged 77 after complications following heart surgery and a stroke. His reputation is founded on the two or three hundred short stories he wrote in a burst of creativity from about 1952 when he was 24. His work was a delight, crisply written, intelligently told, brimming with ideas and threaded with a sense of paranoia that did not take itself too seriously. Half a century later, the mordant humour and lightly satirical tone of these stories afford a wonderful glancing view of consumerist, status-seeking America. The world of the Saturday Evening Post, Senator Joe McCarthy and the social critic Vance Packard. This was an era when the US emerged from isolationism into an expansive modern state, simultaneously innocent and corrupt. In a just world, Sheckley would be recognised as one of the most important American short story writers of the 20th century. But, as anyone who has read him knows, while justice might in theory be available, it is not for everyone, and then only with a catch. His heroes, Innocents Abroad, were also ingenious, resourceful, capable of action, and always able to utter plain common sense in a galaxy full of conmen, unscrupulous advertisers and inscrutable aliens. Sheckley began writing science fiction soon after graduating with an arts degree from New York University. He was born in Brooklyn and had gone straight from high school to the US Army, serving during the Korean War. Living in a low-rent apartment in New York, he began pouring out stories, but his work was not immediately popular with the fans. In retrospect, he was recognised as an iconic 1950s SF writer, but at the time he was swimming against the mainstream. He found natural homes in two relatively new magazines, Galaxy, and the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, both with editors interested in broadening the appeal of SF by concentrating on style, wit and storytelling, as opposed to engineering. That these magazines grew to prominence was at least partly Sheckley's doing, as his stories set a tone that others followed. Once his stories began appearing in book form, the first was Untouched by Human Hands in 1954, they were regularly reprinted in anthologies, and his collections appeared in Britain and on the continent, the critics took notice. About this period, Sheckley himself was modest. Although versed in the traditions of SF and socialising with other writers in the genre, his main influences were from outside. He acknowledged Aldous Huxley, Mark Twain and Victor Hugo, and once said that the form his stories took was shaped more by poetry than by other short stories. The first novel, Immortality Incorporated, appeared in 1959 and was filmed in 1993 as Free Jack, with Emilio Estevez and Mick Jagger. A string of similar works followed, full of ingenuity, but the essential passivity of the protagonists, who move in a bemused way through upside-down societies, did not work as well in novels as in short stories. Several other works were filmed, most notably A Seventh Victim, made in 1965 as La Decima Vitima, The Tenth Victim. That was the one where Ursia Andres fired bullets from her bikini top. One of Sheckley's best but least known novels, The Man in the Water, from 1961, a Hemingway-esque saga of two men battling it out on a becalmed yacht, was also filmed. The result, Escape from Hell Island, is long forgotten. 
A restless man, Sheckley, took to travelling from the mid-1960s, living in Mexico, Ibiza, London and Paris before returning to the US in 1980, when, for a couple of years, he was fiction editor of Omni magazine. He was married five times, with a daughter each by his second and third wives. A shambling, stammering man, always genial, endlessly kind, he made friends in every country he visited. He became a close friend of mine in London in the late 1970s, by which time he was bedeviled with writer's block and the distractions of the itinerant life. One evening, we caught part of Douglas Adams' Hitchhiker's Guide on the radio. This was before it was famous. Sheck listened in silence, without a smile. I asked him what he thought of it, and he replied, He writes good jokes. He didn't add what seemed obvious to me, that most had originally been his. Robert Sheckley, author, born July 17, 1928, died December 9, 2005. So why cover a Robert Sheckley book on Breakfast in the Ruins? Well, I love Robert Sheckley, for one. And for another thing, I was getting old dog-eared copies of his books from Pops back in the day along with all the Moorcock and everything else. And one of those was a book called Options. So, join us on our journey to the surface of Harmonia for an unusual trip. And it is a trip into the mind of Robert Sheckley. <laughs> Uh, we're back in Derry and Tom's and we've had a lot of third time visitors this year and I think this is your third time back on Breakfast in the Ruins, Derek. So it's Derek, a.k.a. the massively pro prolific recording artist, Imria. Welcome back. It's good to be back. And yes, the third time. It's uh, great to have you back. Now, I just mentioned that you're terrifically prolific and every time I buy your discography on Bandcamp, I look away... And it seemingly, I look back a couple of weeks later, and you've released three more albums. I know, so, I'm sorry. <laughs> what, what's been on your uh, what's been on your itinerary these last few months? I mean, it's probably over a year since you were last on. When did we do? What did we do last? The Black Corridor. Ah, uh, Black Corridor. That was early, yeah. early 2023, wasn't it? So, yeah. What have you What have you been up to in the last year? Well, ten uh, months, however many it is. Just making music. That's really all I do. I go to work and I yeah. come home and I make music. So. <laughs> <laughs> and what have you been putting out? The last one I put out was um, I, I, so a sci-fi story that uh, yeah. is my own. I, I've sort of been trying to like get away from um, book-inspired um, albums. Not not out yeah. of I don't. You know what happened? Um, I had put out a another Hyperion-based album, and like two weeks yeah. later, I found an article about like what a turd Dan Simmons is. <laughs> apparently oh. he's like a real like pos yeah. and i think like uh margaret curljoy had posted about it and then i was like oh fuck it. i don't know i just kind of getting fed up with that <laughs> i don't know yeah i have my own I, ideas i, I, I have read my own something things. about that myself yeah and, uh, so, so mm. yeah uh you know i'm still i'm not gonna completely avoid novels or books that i like on that principle yeah um because i mean i still enjoy the stuff, even if the person who wrote it happens to be a piece of shit, unfortunately. So I don't know. Yeah, it's back to that old argument of separate the artist from the art when he can, isn't it? Yeah. yeah uh, but so. but it does get quite tiring. Yes. Um, yes. Having to do that. Yeah. It so yeah. So the last album I put out was just my own imagination, my own head. Um, yeah. Just another little like proggy sci-fi soundtrack thing. Yeah. Uh, a bit more in the style of uh, that errant album that I had done also yes. since then, which is particularly like Prague electronica feeling yeah. as opposed to um the more dungeon synth style or esque sort of slow moving albums i usually do i don't know it's a, it's a different style that i've been playing around with so yeah well you know what i'll send everybody a link to that and if you want us to do we can always stick one of the tracks on at the end of this podcast to uh, give everybody a listen but we can talk about that later yeah, so yeah. No. we did the black corridor last time around and this time of course we're going to talk about a book which is quite dear to me by Robert Sheckley called Options and we talked about this briefly maybe three or four months ago and then it took us a while to actually plan it in as it always does because there's not enough fucking hours in the day to actually do the things that are fun in life when it comes to uh, figuring out how to do things in between working but Sheckley of course fellow New Yorker how aware were you of Robert Sheckley? Not at all. How Not aware of Sheckley so this is your first ever Sheckley yeah, it was one hell of a first ever book by an author. <laughs> yeah, in a way, I'm kind of sorry about that. 
<laughs> because this is probably maximum Sheckley. <laughs> my, my first. I, uh, to be, sorry, I didn't. I didn't hate it. <laughs> yeah, I, I had read a bunch of the reviews of um, you know after I don't I don't read them before I read it, but people tearing it apart on account of just the way that it is. But I, I enjoyed it. I think it's yeah. I came across this because back in the day when I was a teenager, I got two other Sheckley novels off Pops. One was Dimension of Miracles and one was The State of Civilization. I read these when I was a teenager and I absolutely loved them. I was reading Philip K. Dick as well and various other bits and pieces. And I think Sheckley's style of science fiction um, is probably largely overshadowed by Philip K. Dick, but also I think generally considered to be lesser because of the... Um, irreverent sense of humor that kind of runs through it all but dimension of miracles is absolutely fantastic i was just looking up sheckley actually when i was thinking about doing this and i didn't realize and i sh i don't know why this passed me by but his first book immortality incorporated which i think was serialized in 1958 was the basis for that terrible emilio estevez film free jack oh, no, i know and i don't know <laughs> if you've ever seen free yeah, jack yeah yeah, yeah. I saw that cinema when it came out, and I don't remember a thing about it other than coming out thinking, God, that was absolute balls. <laughs> <laughs> but it turns out it's based on a Robert Sheckley novel, which somehow completely passed me by. So these, these books came from Pops. But at the time, my uncle Phil, who also had a lot of books that you know came from Pops, I, I got them either from Pops directly or Phil would give me them later on after he'd read them. And he said to me one day, he said, give this a read. I want to know what you make of it. And he handed me this copy of Options, this uh, 1976, I think, pan science fiction copy of Options. And, uh, well, describe the cover for us, Derek, because I sent you um, the exact same edition. Well, it's um, some sort of, um, well, I think I know, this is probably the WAP worm, maybe? I don't know, because <laughs> I think it had more heads yeah. than that. This is not yeah. some sort of three-headed uh, monster on top of a sort of a orb-like robot with spider legs. So. Yeah. Um, I think in some ways you could argue that perhaps it is reflective of the content. But once you read this book, I think the sheer amount of – you could come up with an infinite amount of images and any one of them you could probably say would be sort of appropriate for this book. Well, this came from my Uncle Phil, and he said, I want you to read this because I just can't get my head around what it's supposed to be. And I read it, and now at the time – I was probably doing far too many mushrooms. <laughs> so I loved this book. Oh, so it this made perfect sense, yeah. Well, this is the first time I've read it in probably 33 or 34 years. And I did enjoy this book, but for some of the same reasons, if I think now about the idea of taking mushroom tea, I just have a panic attack. It's not something I could ever possibly contemplate and haven't been able to contemplate for over 30 years. But there are some reasons why I like this book at the time that I still stick with. But also I've I've discovered a few more reasons to like it as well. So let's uh so what what does the back of the book say it is? So it says Tom Mishkin is forced to trek across Harmonia to obtain spare parts for his grounded spaceship. To protect him from the bizarre and sometimes dangerous collection of creatures on this alien planet, there is a special purpose environmental response robot. Unfortunately, beneath a cylindrical fuck's sake, I can't even speak already. And that this is going to come down to my choice of absurdist beer, which I'll get to <laughs> shortly. Unfortunately, beneath a cynical exterior, his robot buddy is definitely bewildered and sometimes less than competent. Together, they chart a zigzag course from the improbable to the phantasmagoric and beyond. I don't know. What do you think? How how accurate is that? I I think it's very accurate. Also. It really, I think it really does hold a narrative. I, I don't, hmm. A lot of the judgment I had read about it was like, oh, you know, it just falls apart. But yes, I think I that disagree. zigzagging path makes complete sense. Like when it just, it works. He he manages yeah. to do it quite well, I think. It's not yeah. as messy as people seem to see yeah, it. Yeah, I think people give this book a hard time because it's so unconventional. It's really and unconventional. I, I don't think that's necessarily that fair. But at the end of the day, some t if people, if someone wants to pick up a sci-fi book or a fantasy book with a cover like this and they want something that makes narrative sense and goes from A to B to C to D and has plot points and character arcs and all those great things, then I can understand why they might be disappointed it's, by this It's not book. that. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, I even though the back of the book is relatively accurate in terms of setup, 
I don't think it really gives any indication of just how much it swings for the fences on the phantasmagoric front. Right. It it really does go for it. What we have on the face of it is a kind of travelogue stroke road movie type deal with pilot Mishkin, who's in space, and he needs a part for his spaceship, which is failing. So this Terran Federation or whatever it is, they have this system where they have worlds that are pre-supplied for just such an occasion with parts and equipment and one of these spare robots for assistance. However, we very, very quickly come across complications. Now, one one of the interesting things about when you read the coverage of all these books is there are lots and lots of descriptions of it as absurdist. And I thought, what do they mean by absurdist? Do they just mean it's is that just another way of saying it's a bit it's a bit bonkers? And I think that's probably exactly what they're saying is this book is in some ways batshit crazy in the way that it tackles what it tackles. But as you pointed out, it does start to make some level of sense and you start to understand what the author is actually trying to accomplish and actually succeeding, I think. I think a lot of it, just the the lack of um, transition or establishment of change of scene really throws you off as to how it relates back to what's going on. Uh, so like these little interjections, interjections that are just a paragraph or two that seem completely unrelated and re- like do relate back in some way, but there's nothing explaining yeah. to you. It's just, that's, that's what makes it seem like this absurdist, which I'm not saying it's not, but that just leans more into like, what the hell am I reading? What's going on? Like, what is this nonsense? Yeah. But it, it, yeah, it makes its case. It, I think <laughs> There is a huge part of the book where you could probably cut this book up into pieces and jumble them all up and reassemble it. And it might not necessarily, other than the last probably 30 pages of the book, which we'll get to, you could probably chop this book into pieces, keep the first couple of pages, keep the last 30 pages, jumble everything in the middle up with the exception of a few bits which you would put at the right points. And it wouldn't make a massive amount of difference to how this book, how your brain consumes it. We could at any point, I think, open this book at random pages and read a bit out and it will give you a really, really good idea of what this book is about. But I have actually picked a bit. And I think when some of the critics are talking about it being absurdist and everything else, I was trying to get my head around. How, how do we talk about this on the podcast? How do we get across to people what an absurdist science fiction novel is like? Um, and I just thought, in order to pull back from the brink where we start talking about Dadaism and science fiction and maybe sound a bit up our own asses, I thought, no, don't mm-hmm. go there. So instead, I'm going to talk about, very briefly, the absurdist beer that I've chosen for this <laughs> evening's discussion. And I have got, I'm going to kick off with, what's, what have you got? Are you, are you having an afternoon bevy? Uh, no, I was going this? to. I, I had a bowl of cereal right before we started. and Beer after cereal All makes right. my stomach turn. <laughs> Okay, well, in that case, I'll I'll do it for both of us. Right, I have got a Vault City Iron Brew Float. Now, you're a New Yorker. I have no idea if you have any concept of what Iron Brew is. No. Nope. Right. Iron Brew is Scotland's favourite soft drink. It's spelled I-R-N-B-R-U, Iron Brew. And the ad line back in the, in the UK, back in the day, had the tagline, Made in Scotland from Gerda's. And it's it's a rust red soda, like fizzy drink, that doesn't taste like anything other than iron brew. <laughs> so you know you know various regions in America and various states have their own like weird state pops. Yeah, yeah. And sodas. It's one of those. It's very, very particular. In the UK, I think when I was growing up, there were probably two soft drinks that really didn't taste like anything else. There was iron brew and there was Tizer. You don't see ties of that much anymore, but Iron Brew is still a really big thing. And I have drunk Iron Brew on this show before, but I drank gin and Iron Brew, and I dubbed it the Rusty Gerda when I was uh, um, having a drink and doing something with Graham. But on this occasion, I've actually got a dedicated beer by Vault City called Iron Brew Float, and it's 5.5%. And what does it say here? It says, imagine a dollop of soft vanilla ice cream dropped into a fresh glass of fizzy Iron Brew this sweet scoop surrounded by a moat of orangey goodness known as a float. An iconic dessert with a Scottish twist 
gets twisted twice for our latest brew and dialed up to 5.5%. So God knows what this is going to taste like. I'm hoping it just tastes like iron brew. But you know what? We'll find out. So, yeah, going back to what I was talking about. Oh, it's the color of iron brew. Anyway. As a listener of the podcast as well, one of the subplots of all your uh, podcasts is the hor- horrors of the beers you drink. Sometimes you, when you describe them, or like, I'll Google, you'll reference stuff that I have no, no context for what you guys are talking about as far as the alcohol goes. And it just seems yeah. like a wild and strange journey you take. Yeah. An, an old buddy of mine. <laughs> Ness, I'll say say hello to Ness. And nobody mind Ness. He he listened to one of the first episodes we did, and he messaged me and said it was so fascinating because I was listening to the introduction and it sounded really deep, like an analysis of the author and the subject matter. And then it got to the it got to the subject matter, and I heard you say, "What the fuck is an upcycled cocoa pop?" And it was like whiplash. <laughs> it's like, well, yeah, that's that's probably fair. Which is why I put less effort into the into the intellectual analysis than I used to because I don't want to give people whiplash. But anyway, I poured it into my Seabrooks cheese and onion a pale ale glass. I'm going to give that a go. Cheers. Uh, it doesn't really taste like iron brew, but it does taste slightly orangey and pleasant doesn't taste in any way like booze and that could be a good or a bad thing so compared to some of the stuff i've subjected loss to recently that's actually quite a good start unlucky loss loss is over next weekend and we're talking about the weird of the white wolf and i've got some real horrors lined up for him <laughs> but but anyway so I'd, I'd picked out a couple of pages and i thought these two pages as well as any other pages in this book give a pretty good indication of what it reads like so here we go Mishkin and the robot were strolling through the forest one day in the merry, merry month of May when they happened to surprise a pair of bloodshot eyes in the merry, merry month of May. Nothing is very funny when you're underneath. Stand up and be counted, Mishkin's father had said to him. So Tom Mishkin stood up to be counted, and the number was one. This was not very instructive. Mishkin never stood up to be counted again. Let's take it now from the point of view of the monster who was approaching Mishkin. Usually reliable sources tell us that the monster did not feel at all monstrous. The monster felt anxious. That is the way everyone feels, except when they are drunk or high. It would be good to remember that when making any strange contacts, the monster feels anxious. Now, if only you can convince him that you too, despite being a monster, also feel anxious. The sharing of anxieties is the first step in communication. Ouch, said Mishkin. What's the matter, said the robot. I stubbed my toe. You'll never get out of this spot like that. What should I do? It might be best to continue strolling. The sun beat down. The forest contained many colours. Mishkin was a complicated human being with a past and a sex life and various neuroticisms. The robot was a complicated simulacrum of a man and might just as well be considered a man. The creature who was approaching them was a complete unknown but can be presumed to have had a certain pleasurable amount of complication about him. Everything was complicated. As Mishkin approached the monster, he had various fantasies, none of which are interesting enough to record. The monster also had various fantasies. The robot never permitted himself fantasies. He was an old-fashioned, inner-directed, Protestant ethic type of robot, and he didn't hold with tomfoolery. There were drops of crystal clear water trembling on the green, pouting, heart-curved lips. Actually, there weren't drops of water at all. There were decals made in some loathsome factory in Yonkers. The children had decorated the trees with them. The monster, he went a-strolling. He nodded civilly to Mishkin, and the robot nodded civilly to the monster as the stroll passed. The monster did a double take. What in hell was that, he asked. Beats the hell out of me, said one of the perambulatory trees, who have moved back from the North 40 in hopes of making a killing on the stock exchange. I think that is a pretty good example of what numerous passages in this book are like. And also, the don't conclude. (laughs) No. (laughs) Just strange little bizarre passages so that is pretty indicative of the kind of stuff you get in this book you get these strange and let's call them absurd um passages and situations your music has interpreted a lot of mocock over the time you've interpreted a lot of sci-fi like dan simmons who i've already mentioned but also harder sf like alistair reynolds is this the type of stuff that could inspire you to compose when i read this book in my head i hear more like um like really um twangy psychedelic like the small faces are like yeah <laughs> 13 floor elevators that's the kind yeah. of music that this makes me think would uh be appropriate yeah 
Oh. It is it is quite out there. And again, when I was looking into his old um, output, Immortality Incorporated was also the subject of an adaptation on the BBC in the late 60s, which was one of those old BBC programmes called Out of the Unknown, which was recorded over. So the episode doesn't exist anymore because in those days the BBC would record things on tape uh-huh. and then just wipe them and record over them, which is why there are so many episodes of 1960s Doctor Who lost and the, the, the turn up in strange African TV stations where copies were sent in the 1960s or 70s. Well, this is one of those episodes. But on the Peter Jackson BBC, um, sorry, the Peter Jackson The Beatles film, that I think was, was it on Netflix or whatever it was on? In the first episode, The Beatles are talking about watching that episode of Out of the Unknown. So I could imagine in the late 60s, people were watching things based on Robert Sheckley who were in the in the throes of writing psychedelic albums and everything yeah, else yeah. and thinking, yeah, this is right about a streak. That feels right. The absurdist streak does continue, and it additionally gives way to Sheckley introducing a lot of quite meta and almost intertextual elements. Normally, on this podcast, we'd probably go through the plot blow by blow, <laughs> but we've, all de- we've described the plot. <laughs> that was the plot. What we have now is interesting things. I picked out that bit on page 36 and 37. Were there any bits that would that leapt out to you that thought, I really dig this couple of pages? Well, it's, it's funny. I have a, I had 36 earmarked as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I also, I really, one of my, there, there were so many of these little stories that had like a, a line. Soon after that, we meet the Duke for the first time. Um, yes. And when he meets the Duke, I'll, I'll just read it because I just, Here's starting with a quote from the Duke. It's uncommonly kind of you to warn me, the Duke said, but actually I'm in no danger at all. The danger number is your movie, whereas I am an entirely different and much less satisfactory sequence. That <laughs> I think about that in my daily life all the time. And that like seemed mm. perfectly admitted. Like you are, you know how people judge others being like, oh, you're the star of your own movie. Your like ego is so big. You think you're the center, but like you are going through your own storyline at all times, but so is mm. everyone else. And like yeah. his, his, like him coming across this man who's, who's frantic and panicked because he's lost on this planet and looking for a spaceship. He's like, no, I'm fine. I'm just taking yeah. a stroll. Like, that's not my story right now. Like I, that attitude of towards life is funny to me. And yeah, perhaps. Yeah. Um, the great thing about the Duke and Duchess of Melba chapter is that the character of the Duke actually starts to deconstruct his own depiction on the page. Yeah. When he it? comes back in a little later, it's great. <laughs> yeah. But I love that introduction and, of just just not blowing him off of being like, "Hey, man, that's your story." I don't know. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> the way in which he throws things in and then has quite, in, in some ways, quite an astute and clever deconstruction of something. So he's got a character deconstructing himself. The author himself starts to deconstruct his own book and his own plot further in, and we'll talk about that when we get to it. But there's also a fairly light and amusing. Star Trek stroke lensman stroke classic space adventure section where the the captain of this Terran systems ship is his ship of it's uh, was it? it's Captain John McRoy's super dreadnought class XK-12 X spaceship on picket duty out beyond the Southern Ridge Belt stars and it's the first to pick up the signal that all terror was soon to know and to dread but this was the beginning and the first hint of anything wrong when radio man and class Rip Halliday came to the captain's cabin with a worried look on his homely freckled face. They've discovered this signal that the crew believes to be the first ever contact with alien life, but you get this really quite amusing passage where it says, the captain boomed, take a pew, Rip, drink. Lee Pan Hao, our friendly Cantonese cook, has brewed up some high-energy cocoa that really does the trick. Or how about some Toll House cookies made with real Martian chocolate? No thanks, Captain. Nothing right away. Then slouch back in that easy chair and let's hear what's on your mind. Rip Halliday slouched back, but with a hint of respectful attentiveness. In that age, when a perfect classlessness was observed by all superiors, the utmost informality prevailed. The system worked because inferiors never presumed above their station, and always maintained a perfect measure of respect. Well, sir, I was... Please, Rip, no, sirs, in this cabin. Just call me John. Well, sir, John, I was doing a routine sweep, 
of the 6B2 radio bands, but this time I was using a zero-beat random selector just to see how it worked. If you remember the Thalberg-Martin equations, sir, they postulate... The captain grinned and held up a broad, muscular pink hand. Radio's your field, Rip. I'm just an intergalactic truck driver. I've never got beyond the Sigma series transformations. So put it into plain English. What did you pick up? A signal, Rip answered promptly. It came across loud enough to dent my ear before the AFC cut in. The captain nodded. No cause for alarm, is there? I suppose it was a radio star effect. Halliday shook his head. None in the vicinity. Deflection reading? Not possible, given our present speed and coordinates. No chance it was a mechanically produced static effect, maybe caused by a concentration of cosmic debris grinding together? No chance, sir. The configuration pattern is completely different. And what's more, the signal I got was frequency modulated. The captain whistled softly. No natural discharge could account for that. No, sir. Uh, John. Intelligent life produced these patterns. Hmm, said the captain. Any chance it might be a ship of ours broadcasting? Rip asked hopefully. The captain shook his head. The nearest Terran patrol ship is clear on the other side of Fiona too. Rip whistled softly. I was afraid of that. The captain nodded. It means that we've just contacted alien life of a type completely unknown to us, and we're closing with them. Fast. So you get this really nice thing where you've got the techno babble, the relaxed, unmilitaristic camaraderie, the captain as the audience struck reader surrogate, blandly accepting nonsensical technical explanations, it's fantastic, and it you know it does sound a lot like that kind of sixties, seventies, you know, Forbidden Planet, Star Trek, all of those things that unmilitaristic. We are all the future. We are all going to get on. It, like it just the, reads yeah, the, so nicely. The, the whistling in response to this. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> going up like. Yeah, it's fantastic, and and it, and it continues because the alien threat is really amusing too, for for a reason that that comes up. So it goes to see a cybernetics genius called Marv, the captain. And he says, Marv, how's it going? Pretty good, said Marv Painter, the shy, skinny, red-haired cybernetic genius. We should have an intelligible readout as soon as I splice in this zero-null regenerative impulse rejector into the image repro circuit and cross-tie the translator bank into the computer's second-stage input bank. You mean we'll be able to understand them? Captain McRoy asked. Shucks, yes. It won't be an exact translation because we don't have a vocab matchup, but if we set the computer to sound match in terms of probabilities of meaning and maintain a constant feedback loop to further refine hierarchic distinctions, then we ought to get an accurate analogic reading. But that's just my own haywire idea on it, sir, if you would care to try another approach. Marv, said McRoy, the primary law of interplanetary cooperation is let those who can do, and let those who can't sit in the parlour with their fingers up their noses and their mouths shut and drink their coffee. I'm just a spaceship driver, and you're the cyberneticist around here, and what you say goes as long as you speak it in terms of your admittedly limited speciality. Thanks for the vote of confidence, Cap, said Marv, flashing a smile. If there weren't governments on Earth like you run a ship, it'd be clear sailing for the human race. None of that now, the captain said, with gruff old-fashioned modesty. I just follow the rules, use plain common sense. Temper justice with mercy, and treat every person as an entire world system and end unto himself, despite social differences imposed by a functional ranking system. Is that rig of yours working yet? It's just fucking great. I absolutely love that. It's, it's, his weird cultural social strata ethic that he has with his crew that entirely encapsulates that weird optimistic utopian vision of what space future would be like in a lot of that old space opera and he's casually deconstructed it in such an amusing way it just it happens in such a quick little like what is it like eight pages maybe yeah <laughs> you know and it, and it does have like a voice that's totally different from theirs like it feels like it's just pulled out of some other novel that he wrote you know it's yeah it's it's a great little section that happens a couple of times, doesn't yeah, it? Again, yeah. we'll get to the end, which is just like a massive shift, but for a really interesting reason, which he, which he really sells effectively. But the alien threat is really amusing too, particularly due to the idea that, as Marv has just explained, he's built this translator system. But unlike the ones on TV shows or the ones in science fiction movies or anything like that, Sheckley is kind of identifying a core problem with this kind of thing. The idea that this translator system can only really work contextually 
with language, forms, and systems it's already been given information on, which makes perfect sense. But it makes the translation of the alien really funny. Yeah, it's pretty really good. And Marv is basically explaining how chat GPT works. <laughs> It's impossible to create or predict an entirely alien attitude. All you can do is port it into whatever form your translator already has access to. So it likely ends up either homogenous pap or tonally off or completely inappropriate to the intent. So the exchange with the alien, while quite amusing, nails one of Sheckley's great habits, which in making light of something is deconstructing it really, really well. Because what's, what does the alien end up introducing himself as? Let's have a look. Uh, Thanatos space bum or something. <laughs> Th- Thanatos space bum. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, where are we? Oh, here we go. Marv Peter turned on the set. The video repeater came to life, revealing the interior of an alien spaceship. Within, a creature sat at the controls. He was bipedal, but any resemblance to humanity began and ended there. The creature was jet green, about eight feet tall, and massively constructed. He appeared to have a chitinous exoskeleton. Antennae grew from his forehead, and his eyes extended on stalks. He had a large, loose mouth behind which could be seen double rows of pointed white teeth, as on a shark. The alien spoke. Much greetings, inferior worm-like, barely sentient alien life forms. I am Thanatos Superbum, Captain General of the Malachite Brood, Lord of the Vulturary Doubt, Duke Extraordinary to the O'Neills. <laughs> Duke Extraordinary to the O'Neills, and various other titles, both hereditary and conferred. Down upon your knees, base-born scum, and make nice to your mental, moral, and physical superior. Give your name, rank, and serial number, and explain in 20 words or less why I should not grind your puny bones into pulp. Over. He talks funny, said Engineer McDermott. Funny and mean, said the captain, frowning purposefully. And also weird. A lot of that, said Marv, is because the computer has to analogise the alien speech into the nearest Terran idioms. Selecting from expressions it has at its disposal in its memory banks. So, of course, it comes out sounding kind of weird. One of the other exchanges is... Blood, sweat and sneers, exclaimed Superbum. I smell the blood of an American. To hell with making nice. Not peace, but a sword. Let one claw scratch the other. Lordas, toujours lordas. If at first they don't succumb, trum, trum again. Even allowing for anachronism during analogies, the captain said, this fellow sounds mean, hysterical and full of trouble. The captain turned on the microphone and asked Superbum if things couldn't be settled peacefully. Peace is for commie fags, sneered the alien, but I will make an offer. You may choose to be annihilated at once by the inconceivable force of our deadly ray guns, after which our space fleet will destroy your space fleet, after which we will conquer Earth and implant special radio circuits in the brains of all humans, thus rendering them our slaves and subject to various fates worse than death. Or you can just choose the other alternative. Which is? Just about the same thing, only we will be nicer about it if you don't resist. That's oh, just fucking great. So this idea that this alien can only speak in idioms that already exist within the crew's patois. When I, when it's I first absolutely read, incredible. It was a little jarring um, when I read that, but I was like, oh, all right. <laughs> had that occurred offhanded without the prior explanation of the translation of the alien basically being based upon common language forms and idioms yeah, yeah, yeah. That, the, that the crew actually understand. I can just about get away with it and, and laugh at it. But it is it is amusing. And it's also, with the exception of those last 25 maybe pages, it's probably the longest passage and the most consistent passage in the book when it comes to actually moving something on. But because it's in options, it has no conclusion. <laughs> it just ends and hangs and seems to have no overall relevance to the overall plot. It's just, once again, Sheckley playing around with the form and playing around with the science fiction form as well, which uh, it is pretty entertaining, even though it does have some choice language. And there are a couple, probably a couple of other points in this book where there's some choice language as well. But I never, I never got the point where I felt like whether he, he had any proclivities that were slipping through, it's all, to me, self-analytical, you know? Yeah, I don't know. It's always hard to judge when a book goes so meta. Yeah, I mean, I think the part of that is the the journey of the book in a way. Mm. Especially like b- before this happens, when they when they get to the imaginary castle that they yeah. go back to a few times. There's a couple like mentions of of like 
experiencing reality, accepting reality and, and deciding what the shared reality is. And I think it plays mm. around a lot with yeah. that as it goes in and out of these tales. And, and you know, I think that the way, I mean, it, we'll get to it, but the, when they start involving the author in the telling of the story, it all starts to make sense more. Like when mm. it, um, as far as that goes, I think a lot of what the book ended up being about too, was to me writing a book. Mm. Um, and his, his almost like, it feels like a struggle of having ideas in a story mm. <laughs> and mm. keeping them flowing. It's, it's really interesting. Yeah. It's, it's fascinating. Really. You just refer to like the, the author intruding on the plot and the narrative of the book. And it does go, it goes full meta. It yeah. goes full meta in, in a way that you very, very rarely experience with these kind of books. There's another example here. So you can't really call these chapters because some of them are barely more than a paragraph. But chapter 30 on page 87, it starts. Mishkin and the robot came to a tree. At the end of its branches, there were blue eyes with thick eyebrows. All of the eyes swiveled to stare at Mishkin. I thought you would come by this way, the tree said, speaking from a speaker in its trunk. I hope that you will not deny that you are Thomas Mishkin. That's who I am, Mishkin said. Who are you? I am a bill collector disguised as a tree, said the bill collector disguised as a tree. For Christ's sakes, Mishkin said, did you follow me all the way to Harmonia? Indeed I did. It's rather a curious story. Mr Oppenheimer, head of the Nuplu Ultra Collection Agency, for which I work, got an inspiration while stoned on acid at his local Tai Chi Chuan class. It suddenly occurred to Oppenheimer that the essence of life lies in completions, and a man can only judge his life in reference to the thoroughness with which he has played his life role. Hitherto, Oppenheimer has been an easygoing fellow who followed the usual practice of collecting the easily collectible debts and making a few ominous noises on the difficult ones, but ultimately saying, to hell with them. Then Oppenheimer achieved his satori. To hell with mediocrity, he decided, if I'm head of a bill collecting agency, then I'm going to make an ethic and a girl out of bill collecting. The world may very well never understand me, but perhaps future generations will be able to judge the terrible purity of my motives. And so Oppenheimer embarked upon the poignant and quixotic course that will probably bankrupt him within a year. He called all of his collectors into the ready room. Gentlemen, he said, this time we're going to get it all together. To hell with half measures. Our goal is now 100% enforceability and let the paranoia fall where it may. Go after those debts, be they one dollar or a million. Go to San Sebastian or Samoa, or Sambal 5 if necessary, and don't worry about the costs. We're following a principle now, and principles are always impractical. Boys, we're overthrowing the reality principle. So get out there and collect all of those debts, and groove on completions. His speech is definitely late 1960s, said the robot, whereas this is the year 2138 or thereabouts. Someone is conning somebody. Fuck off, snarled the author. Perfect. So the author is now inserting himself into the story. The robot is thinking, why are these guys talking like that? And the author tells his own character to fuck off. <laughs> it's just, it's wonderful. And thinking back to my uncle reading this and probably thinking at some point, why in this SF novel are the protagonists, whilst on an alien world, talking to three New Yorkers playing cards in a hotel room? Oh, that was midway a great through, scene too. <laughs> that was great. Midway through, one of the protagonists asks a very similar question in the narrative, only for the author to himself to intercede and tell him to fuck off. This is probably why 17-year-old mushroomed adult may love this book so much. Also, uh, that scene, they're playing cards in a hotel room, but your main characters are on the edge of a cliff. Yeah. But they're, that's what's happening at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Like... Yeah. So these, these three guys who just think they're in a New York or a Brooklyn hotel room playing cards in a dingy hotel room. He's having to edge round them because they're blocking his way around the edge of a ravine. And it's, it's, it's wonderful. And, that, uh, that scene is one of, one of the highlights for me. Following that passage that you just read from is the, um, you know, I don't know, section 31 or chapter 31, whatever the, uh, yeah. using phenomena for fun little blurb. Yes. That is, I absolutely love that. What leads into that is, Wonderful, because the robot kills the bill collector with an axe while Mishkin is pleading his case. And the robot says to Mishkin, never explain anything, avoid bummers, don't go on other people's trips. <laughs> and I definitely learned the truth of that during my mushroom days. Never go on other people's <laughs> trips. 
ever. But yeah, you're right. It's using phenomena for fun. Enjoy a visit to the phenomenal world. Have a human experience, the most fascinating of all experiences. Now you too can experience carnal love, unjustified rage, bad faith. You too can know boredom, annui, angst. Is that accidy? I really um, should have looked that up. Acidity, yeah, I think it's like spiritual exhaustion. Ah. Thrill to the experience of your life slowly draining away. Feel the inevitable death, which you know to be a plunge into pure nothingness. Live a life of contradictions. Have a wife. Lust for other women. Possess them and never know satisfaction. Have children and feel anxiety, love, hate. Learn how to be concerned about possessions. Worry about your job. Identify yourself with what you own. Feel cowardice. Derange your senses with drugs. Live the working sleep of mortality, lit with uneasy flashes of something else. Experience the poignancy of wanting a better life and striving for it and never achieving it. Be swayed by external and internal stimuli. Be a passive receptor who is acted upon by forces beyond his control. Have convictions, beliefs, likes and dislikes for no rational reason. Feel the intoxication of faith. Thrill to the passion of religion. Apply now! No angels under the age of 20,000 years will be allowed into the phenomenal world without written permission from God. I really love this book. And yeah. I think I enjoyed it as a teenager, but reading it now, I think I enjoy it perhaps even more. And this might be the passage, and the passage about the, the robot saying, avoid bummers and don't go on other people's trips. I think it might be the passage that I took quite literally to when I first read it, because I dimly seem to remember reporting back to my <coughs> uncle and explaining to him, this is basically sci-fi Alice in Wonderland, but the planet is the rabbit hole, the cake marked eat me, and the hole works. But unlike, unlike Alice, the pilot never really escapes. <laughs> and that's probably how I read it when I was a teenager. I think the, the much more meta stuff about an author deconstructing his own story whilst interesting never quite sunk in as much with me as a teenager as it did do on this reading. And reading it now, I think Sheckley was probably, as well as writing a fun tale with an unconventional narrative and playing with the form, I think he's also deconstructing his own approach to SF and just dialing it up to 11. But the great thing about it is either explanation could work. You could even say this entire book is from the robot's perspective and there's something in the atmosphere that makes the robot trip and, and the robot is just tripping balls the entire way through and, and providing a narrative and... and it, it could work on a number of trippy levels. So this, this is probably mid to late career Sheckley as well. And I had a quick look at his history. And I've mentioned being amazed to see Immortality Incorporated was basically the, the best free jack. But I think since this came out, there was probably two or three more that he did in the 80s that maintained the humorous irreverent style but edged more into mock space opera with metaphysical elements some of which is kind of trying out here. But weirdly, by the 1990s, his writing is a writer for hire, writing for established IPs like Alien, Star Trek, and Babylon 5. Uh, he wrote one novel for each. I've, I've never read the Babylon 5 novel because I never really got into Babylon 5, so you know it wasn't something that I would do. I've never read the Deep Space Nine novel because whilst I like Deep Space Nine for probably three out of seven seasons, I think it had a real sweet spot in the middle, me and my mate Rich used to, we lived together in a flat and we were on the door and we, every, our, our gyro, our, our, um, what would you call it in the States? Our welfare check alternated weeks. So I mm -hmm. got mine on one Wednesday and he got his the following Wednesday and they were fortnightly. So every Wednesday we had shopping day and we'd go to a whole supermarket called Quicksave and buy two litre bottle, would, would buy cheap bread, cheap cake, cheap beans, cheap, everything and they sold things like value cola flavor drink that was 12p for two liters you know would, would would get our shopping in but we also it coincided that period of my life with deep space nine being released on vhs once a fortnight so once a fortnight one of us could buy the latest deep space nine vhs tape which came in really terribly unhandy years later when dvd came out and we both had these enormous shelves of vhs tapes with two episodes each but we ended up getting rid of them all so i really liked deep space now for a period but i never did read novels anyway i've been banging on there but yes he wrote a deep space nine novel 
I did read his earlier novel called Harvest simply because I knew it existed because I saw it in a second hand shop and I was like, what the fuck? Robert Sheckley wrote an alien novel. So I, back, I grabbed that and read it, but it was a novelization of one of the um, Dark Horse alien comic strips from, I think, the early 90s. But he wrote a Deep Space Nine novel called The Laertian Gamble. And this is, see if this sounds like it could be Sheckley esque, right? So this isn't a novelization of episodes, this is an original Deep Space Nine tale by Robert Sheckley. It says, when a mysterious alien woman from the planet Laertes convinces Dr. Bashir to gamble for her at Quark's gaming tables, things seem innocent enough. Yet the more Dr. Bashir wins, the more things go wrong in the Federation. All ships vanish. Planets lose their atmosphere. Suns go nova. The cause and effect is hard to understand, but is proven by the bizarre Laertian science called complexity theory. When Bashir tries to stop gambling, a Laertian war fleet appears to force him to continue while on the planet Laertes itself, Major Kira and Science Officer Dax must battle their way through chaos and danger to find a way to stop the Laertians and save Deep Space Nine and the Federation from utter destruction. That is such a Sheckley-esque plot description. Don't stop gambling or the universe will implode. (laughs) It's absolutely incredible. But Miles and I have been talking recently about covering... Moorcox, The Coming of the Terror Files, Moorcox, Doctor Who novel. Because lots and lots of our favourite authors ended up writing for IPs. And in the last episode, we were talking about Michael Butterworth writing Space 1999 novelizations. And when we did our Christmas special, one of our quiz questions was a one star review that ended up being for the, or several one star reviews that ended up being for The Coming of the Terror Files. And so I thought, ah. I wonder if it's got terrible reviews from hardcore Star Trek fans. So I had a look, and it didn't take long to rustle one up. And we'll be talking more on the the perils of writing for IPs and the coming of the Terrifiles in a few episodes. But let's have a look at one of these reviews. And the title is, The Ending is Crap. And it reads, I haven't read any book with more errors in how it was produced. Made up words that aren't nouns. Sentences and paragraphs repeated due to non-existent editing. A chapter that starts, then suddenly ends in the middle of a sentence, just to start over again as if this was completely normal? See how bad that is? These are not trivial mistakes that require a PhD to uncover. They're glaring mistakes that show that this book wasn't given the first glance by an editor before it being published. Then there's the poor writing, referring to DS9 as a ship. Aliens living (laughs) in the Gamma Quadrant espousing human idioms from Earth. Characters acting completely out of character. The author clearly doesn't understand the Star Trek universe, and the editor... Yes, of course, as an editor, my snarky observation was just that. Doesn't either. The ending is unbearable. The author wraps it all up in the space of a few paragraphs with the lamest resolution I've read ever. I was hoping that there would be something more than the artist shows up and the problem is resolved just like that. I wanted to enjoy this book and just ended up suffering through it. If you skip this book, you'll be missing nothing of note of interest. Amazon, I want my money back. Amazing. Harsh, but not unlike the one-star reviews in the coming of the terror files to be honest but anyway as you can see i ordered a copy <laughs> and at some point i hope to get around to reading it because i want to do what i want to know what robert sheckley does with a crazy star trek plot line where julian bashir gambling almost destroys the universe <laughs> uh yeah i'm looking forward to reading that but we'll get to it at some point back to options Wait, i want to clarify something mm. The episodes would come out two on episode on VHS. Yep. Like as the show was running on. T- so instead of like broadcast, you would have to buy it to see it. Or was it yes. also broadcast over there? I, I think it might have been getting broadcast on Sky, but there was a delay. And uh-huh. we were too skint to have Sky, Sky TV. So we couldn't afford satellite TV or cable. I'm struggling to remember whether Sky even properly existed at that point. It probably did, or it might have been British satellite broadcasting. I can't remember. But there was always a big delay. It's not like, I mean, these days were, yeah. were spoiled. If things are on H- HBO or Netflix or any of these things, these big sci-fi TV shows or Apple TV, you know, we, we just recently resubscribed to Apple TV just so we could watch season four or five, whatever it was, for all mankind. Everything's instantaneous now. But in those days, with how crap British telly was, you were basically relying on will they have a VHS release? I did the I did the same with Farscape. I think BBC Two dropped 
showing Farscape at one point. So we ended up having to buy them on VHS. Oh, do, do you know? I can't remember. I can't remember. But yeah, we essentially bought several seasons between us of Deep Space Nine on VHS tapes. That's- and then when VHS basically died, we were left with shelves and shelves of shelves of VHS tapes. But I, I did a, a number of those things. I don't know if you've ever come across a, a British TV series called Sapphire and Steel. No, I'm not familiar. Sapphire and Steel was a, a 19, late 70s, maybe 10 of the 80s, only ever ran for one season. And it was about a couple of agents who investigate strange hauntings and eddies in time. And it was 30-minute episodes, and there were six stories, which either were four or six episodes each. And the agents were part of a strange sort of mystical agency that weren't actually human they were representative of elements. So he was literally a representation of steel and she was a representation of like sapphire as an elemental force. So it was pretty fucking weird. And when they were investigating mysteries, it was one was about a railway station haunted by a dead World War One soldier. One was about a house being haunted by a man who appeared in photographs with no face. So you had a man in a pinstripe suit with a bowler hat and a blank features. Fucking terrified me as a kid. Absolutely terrified me. But really, really interesting series. And uh, there was a time when it was released on VHS by ITC or whatever the company was in the UK, but then they went out of print very quickly. So I spent a lot of money assembling the six VHS sets of Sapphire and Steel, probably hundreds of pounds at the time, only for VHS to die and the entire DVD series to come out for 20 quid of course yeah <laughs> that's just how it goes isn't it it's like if you you know it was the only way to, it was, there was no way of downloading it no one was creating rips of these things and torrenting yeah, them yeah, it just, yeah. those things didn't exist yeah so i had a lot a lot of vhs that i spent a lot of money on to assemble that all went to charity shops or goodwill when i moved to bradford to move in with phil years and years later yeah i mean oh, I, maybe I, before that. i'm i'm younger than you but i was still like when i started having my own like money to spend on movies and stuff it was still at the at the end of vhs right so yeah. so like i had yeah. a bunch of vhs that i probably spent too much money on back in you know the early 2000s that 10 years later it's on dvd for like 10 bucks and you're like oh. i think yeah. one of the only ones i have that i'm still like we'll never get rid of is the original THX 1138. Cause mm. when that came out on DVD, it's the director's cut. It's, you can't, you can't yeah. get the original version, no. which is a bummer, but yeah. Yeah. That is really irritating. I got THX 113 out on Blu-ray, just expecting that it would have both versions and yeah. it didn't, which was really irritating. I've actually kept hold of maybe five VHS tapes that I used to have because they were so hard to get hold of. And I've got a couple of them on the shelf. I've got Chinatown Kid and Five Super Fighters, the Shaw Brothers Kung Fu films dubbed into English so wonderfully in the in the the Warner Brothers cases, um, the big cases that you used to get from the from the rental shops. And upstairs somewhere, I've got the original Pre Video Recording Act X certificate in Seminoid, which is a late seventies British science fiction. It's generally considered to be an alien knockoff, but the people who made it claim that it was in production before Alien was. Um, and I've got the original X-rated, again, pre-video recording act, X-certificate Brimstone and Treacle film, uh, the Dennis Potter, is it Dennis Potter? I can't remember, with Sting and Denham Elliott in. But <laughs> I don't play them because I still have a VHS player up there somewhere in a box, but the last time I put a cassette in it was my original x rental copy of slugs the uh the J- the juan pique simon mm-hmm. sean hudson adaptation and it chewed it up <laughs> you never got it back right? <laughs> it, uh, no it ch- chewed it up till it was completely destroyed yeah i was gutted so i've, I've never so i just keep them as interesting artifacts now yeah, they will funny. never think, ever be played i think i still have i held on to about five as well you know like yeah. thx 1138 uh, Wizards, Ralph Bakshi, like just as a kid, yeah. I always wanting that VHS, always wanting to see that movie. Uh, the original Star Wars, of course. And then um, the other two I'll never get rid of are the, the two Vampire Hunter D movies, which have since uh, and only recently been like restored on Blu-ray. But just tracking yeah. those down back then was like, yeah, <laughs> was a, it was an achievement, a feat. <laughs> 
You know, yeah. now, that, now it doesn't matter that I have them, but. No, those pesky youngsters <laughs> will never understand the the trials that we once used to have to go through to to obtain certain forms of media. Yeah. Anyway, slight digression there. Back to options. Mishkin is progressively beginning to undergo, in probably the second third of the book, like a fracturing of self, meeting what may or may not be versions of himself in the form of people like Orchidius, having recollections not so much of his youth, but there's a really, really lovely passage. It's not so much recollections of his youth, but scraps of racket feelings and emotional landscapes kind of coming from his memory of youth. And there's there's so much in this book in terms of, of content that it's easy to overlook just how heartfelt some of it sort of feels. And there's this passage that says, it starts off weird, but it says, Mishkin clung to the outer edges of the face, which began to melt the nose flattening and segueing into the cheek, the eyes bleeding into the hair, the mouth softening and blaring, the handholds pulling out of the silly putty, and Mishkin slid away through obligatory swallow song and long, still Ohio nights, with the crickets raucous in the boxberry hedges, and the telephone lines black against the sky like a diagram of your whole life. It was like that, but it wasn't exactly like that. It was more like those hushed summer nights in the old frame house in Rushmore, Mississippi, when an intolerable sweetness clung to the moist denim stretched over a young girl's sleeping buttocks, and you realised, young though you were, that things were going to happen to you, and you would live by them, and lose by them, but always, somewhere, the river would wind, dark and sinuous, sweet mother of the past, companion of the present, mourner of the irretrievable future. And, oh, you know, okay, there's a reference to a girl's buttocks in there, but when... I found it so mournful and affecting, and it's probably just my age and where I find myself in life at the moment. And this is one of those interesting things about when you read books over your life at different stages in life, what you've experienced recently has such a profound effect on how you read something and how you react to something. And I'm pretty close to the age Sheckley was when he wrote this as well. I think he wrote this at 49 or 50, and I turned 51 last year. But I find I myself increasingly think about these little scraps of memory you know i don't mean like ohio and mississippi but the way the language works in those couple of paragraphs i find myself thinking about those little scraps and that passage is really really evocative and i think even more so since the events of last year it's weird i liked this book as a teenager for a number of reasons and i've already like alluded to the fact that for different reasons on for the same reasons i still like it now but i think i found new ones too and i think I think I might actually love this book on a certain level. I think it's a book that I could probably pick up and reread on a few more occasions. And I'm kind of sorry I left it so long to reevaluate it. And at the end of the day, there's no reason why books should have a traditional narrative structure and that any art should conform to people's expectations. And I think that's really a, a really truly Sheckley esque position. It's, you know? it, it really starts right after that. It, I think for the next like 15 or 20 or so pages, it, it you know continues this like disjunct snippets of moments, but they, yeah. they're they all relating back to past wants and desires and the way he's failed himself. It's just, it is beautiful and sad in a very weird way. Like if you just mm. read it at face value, again, it just continues that like what the hell's going on sort mm. of thing. But it's, it's, it's almost beautiful the way this character is, stuck in his in his brain and feeling the the like regret of things done things not done um mm. i really liked it one of, one of the lines coming up when when he it's just the man um he says like i'm losing my mind non-existent problems have the maximum reality and then mm. that whole passage about like problem resolution like you have a problem mm. here's the answer but if you're creating the problems that don't yet exist then you have an infinite number mm. of realities that you're creating that then have no answers like the the, the perils of, of like worry you know of, of projecting your fears mm. when you have situations you can deal with in front of you it's interesting mm. how, how it, it does fixate on, on this idea for a long time compared to the other ideas in the book where it sort of passes mm. and, and, and goes on and again and that this is also after it starts playing in with the the author himself questioning the story he was writing in the first place and who the main mm. character the whole thing about scrapping the main character like it's it's yeah. it's about it becomes this book about i guess confidence in your choice or regret of choosing something else and it just takes a very interesting turn yeah 
I think this book definitely doesn't get enough credit from people who, who just dismiss it as absurdist or fractured or nonsensical or anything like that. I think Sheckley's putting a lot of himself into this. Even when there are things that feel throwaway, and there's another great example where Mishkin meets God. <laughs> yeah. That's right, and, out, yeah, that's right after the passage you read, I think. It is, The next yeah, thing is, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah it says... <laughs> Mishkin ascended to heaven on a fiery chariot, and there he met the Lord God of hosts, and Mishkin prostrated himself before the deity and said, Lord, Lord, I have sinned, which seemed a pretty good thing to say under the circumstances. But God smiled and raised Mishkin up and said, Rather, Mishkin, say that I have sinned, for what are your sins but the deficiencies that I caused to be put into you in order to test you and give you grievous trials in a dark night of the soul, the point being that you should overcome them. This may be a kind of weird way of operating, but it is unreservedly recommended on page 102 of the bestseller, The Business of Being God, written by a symposium of Parisian intellectuals and American hippies, and published by the Godhead Institution with offices in New York, London, Paris, Ibiza, and Kathmandu, and with a foreword by yours truly. I have failed the crucial test, Mishkin said. I am mean, nasty, greedy, selfish, and uncaring. Don't get into a masochism number, said God. Just as there is love which surpasseth, surpath, surpasseth understanding, so there is understanding which surpasseth love. For have I not written, the last shall be the first? You are kind, Mishkin said, but I don't really understand. Understanding is a down, God said. Be comforted, Mishkin, for your vibrations are okay. And I think right now, I need a vacation. <laughs> and you know what? If the entirety of the Bible was understanding is a down, be comforted because your vibrations are okay, the world would probably be in a slightly better place. You know? Okay, yeah. we're telling people, you know, to abandon the thought of understanding, but you're okay. Your vibrations are good, man. It's great. The book starts to really kind of advance that author testing his own narrative and deconstructing himself now because as a sort of acknowledgement that the engine part, the MacGuffin technically of this book hasn't featured for a while, Sheckley, because he's, he's, he's kind of intruded on the narrative now and is, is, is referred to as the author or the man with a thousand disguises. Yeah. He invades the narrative and sends cops to try and secure it. <laughs> Some guy's got it. So the author sends cops to try and get it, but they fail. And, and you've alluded to this already. Is if it couldn't get more bonkers, the spaceship's part story culminates in, again, the author invading the narrative to tell Mishkin that the spaceship thread is getting dropped because it's just not working. And not only that, but he's going to replace him with a new hero called Mr. Hero. But when Mr. Hero has a meeting with Mishkin and expresses concern at the lack of plot and there being nothing for him to grip on, the author scraps that idea too. <laughs> yeah, it's like Mis it Mishkin like convinces him to like disappear into the absurdity of the story <laughs> that he's experiencing. It's yeah. Uh, so before he before the author brings the police in, he I like that he gets the phone call from his uncle and is like you know like you're in a desperate situation and like uh, uncle my Adam. uncle knows people and then he goes into that like well the cousin of whatever knows someone who can works at the shipping company they'll help you out you know like one of those phone yeah. calls with when you're desperate you don't want to reach out to your parents because that's a little embarrassing so you know like yeah you got the cool uncle you're gonna talk to and ask yeah. for help like. Yeah, it's... yeah, it's great. Everybody always lets everybody down, apart from Uncle Arnold, who's <laughs> yeah. solid, and he'll sort this problem out. But even Uncle Arnold can't sort it out. So the, the author scraps this idea. So you know, so far so conventional, I suppose. But then it gets to part two, and of course we forgot to mention. I think that part the book is split into two parts. So we'll just add part one, which is this crazy Alice in Wonderland narrative, which further and further deconstructs itself. But part two, I didn't remember this at all. I had no memory of this from when I thought back to, you know, when I read this 30 plus years ago. Part two is much, much shorter. And intriguingly, the man of a thousand disguises imposes himself on this quite quickly. And what you've essentially got is the book is entirely transposed to a completely different genre, a completely different cast of characters a sort of mysterious Wilbur Smith-style North African setting, albeit with, you know, Sheckley flourishes. And it's so unexpected and so great and so nicely and evocatively written 
and you get this like group of characters who all dock at a place called what is it? It's called Arachnis. But it seems to be the North African curse because there are references to Aden and Morocco. And it reminds me a little bit of what's the um is it Interzone in Naked Lunch? But it's a little bit more little bit more grounded in terms of it feels like a proper North African city setting, but you've got this arachnis. And you get this strange process where inverted commas the fat man is attempting to secure the spaceship engine so the entire problem of the spaceship engine becomes part of a maybe 15 to 20 page north african adventure novel that might have been written by someone like wilbur smith or it even feels like it reads in some ways like a tarzan novel without tarzan yeah, I was I was trying to pinpoint. Um, I feel like it's it's vague whether or not it's North African because they also like. Yeah. I was trying to like look up the rivers they mentioned and, and and the places to see if any of it was real. And I don't think any of it yeah. was. Um, and it, it also no, they also refer to it as as like South Asian, and there's references yes. to to Malaysia. Yeah. So it's it's just like a broad scope of just like the entire British Empire of yeah, of, that's of why it gave like me that anywhere into, that Britain had colonized yeah. all exists in this one. Um, That's why it gave me that. In, like, it's not what what is it in Naked Lunch? It's not Interzone, but it's it's like a, a strange mixture of like Moroccan bazaars mm-hmm. and various other things, and you know, street traders with monkeys, and all. it's all so beautifully written and so evocative. It's great, and it's unexpected. I, I would read an entire Robert Sheckley book in this setting, yeah, because it's yeah. so beautifully constructed. But he's just doing it. To it's like the, the, the author saying, right, that entire science fiction planet harmonia stuff hasn't worked. I've deconstructed it. It still hasn't worked. Let's do it something. Com- let's do it completely differently. Even though it reads like you know a Wilbur Smith novel, you've still got the the, the weirdness. Like um, they're sat in bamboo armchairs, and a white coated houseboy brought round a, tr- a tray of icy gin pahits. The fat man lifted his glass in silent tribute and said, "You seem to be doing nicely for yourself, Jameson." I can't kick, the hard-faced American replied. I'm the only trader in these parts, you know. I do a fair business in emeralds. Then there's the rare birds and butterflies. Little gold gets panned in the alluvian streams in land. An occasional trinket comes my way from the Comar tombs. And, of course, I picked up various other things from time to time. One is surprised at your convenient lack of competitors, said the Arab, in flawless Lancashire English. <laughs> Which, when you're from the north of England... An Arab in a Wilbur Smith style novel speaking in flawless Lancashire English is a bit is a bit out there because I suppose for an American who was you remember the series Frasier? You had the English mm-hmm. character yeah. in Frasier. She had she had the broad Manchester accent. Yeah. That's a Lancashire accent. So he speaks in a flawless Lancashire mm-hmm. accent, which is which is funny. And then you've got the other characters at the point. There's there's an English one that says, uh, something itching you, son, Jameson said with deadly mildness. If there is, I'll let you know, said the boy, his blue eyes blazing. And the name isn't Son, it's Billy Banterville. That's who I am and who I expect to be. And anyone who says otherwise is a dirty liar, and I'll be pleased to take him apart. Take him apart, take him apart. Oh my God, my skin is crawling off. What's happening to my skin? Who lit the fuses of my nerves? Why is my brain boiling? My head hurts. I need, I need. The fat man looked towards the Arab and nodded imperceptibly. The Arab took a hypodermic syringe from a flat black leather case, filled it with a colourless liquid from the plastic ampule, and deftly injected the solution to the boy's arm. Billy Banterville smiled and laid back in his chair like a jointless puppet. His pupils so enlarged that no whites could be seen, an expression of indescribable happiness upon his thin, tight face. A moment later, he vanished. Good riddance, said Jameson, who had watched all of this without comment. Why did you bother to keep a character like that? He had his uses said the fat man. And that actually reads like something from The Naked Lunch as well. Midway through all of this stuff, there is a tiny little passage where it says, The man of a thousand disguises stared uneasily, almost awake, almost recognised himself. Out for a swim in the collective pool of the unconscious. Name, Proteus. Occupation, Shapechanger. Sex, any. Brocard, Nexus. Perseverance brings sublime success. Despite the pain, Proceed by contiguities. Premature closure is false healing. Do not anticipate. All movement is a search. All expectation is of failure. All searches find completion in their origins. The entire pattern is implicit in the first stitch. 
The initial brushstroke is the ultimate ornament, but this is forbidden knowledge since this entire dance must be danced. Initial movement is always initiation. Mishkin's presence must be inferred by his absence. Mishkin's engine part is found. All that remains is to find it. Do not cut along the line. So a nice little reminder to us that this entire switch of genre and setting and characters is still in service of finding Mishkin's fucking engine part. But of course, it doesn't really work out <laughs> because the fat man, <laughs> whilst he's this close to negotiating and obtaining the engine so he can part, so he can set it to harmonia, gets told that he's severely ill, but they'll look after him and house him. So he decides just to essentially spend his last couple of months dying in happiness. And learning to accept death. It's so strange. Yeah. The author informs Mishkin of this by letter. <laughs> it's absolutely fantastic. The author informs Mishkin, you're not getting the engine part, he informs him by letter. Dear Tom, I've tried everything in my power and quite a few things beyond my power to send you that engine part and get you out of this unfortunate mess, which I take full responsibility for getting you into. I even went so far as to construct an entire new sequence with impeccable supporting logic and character relationships, all for the sole purpose of delivering the engine part to you. But my main new character caught the plague, lost all interest in life, and summarily refused to complete the job I had created for him. I tried to get his two helpers to do it, but they'd fallen in love and gone off to the social islands to make jewellery and live on organic foods. <laughs> so I spent a hell of a lot of time and wordage to no purpose whatsoever. I really am sorry, but that was my last bright idea, and now my doctor tells me I must take a rest. Tom, forgive me, my nerves are shot. I'm broke, and there's simply nothing more I can do for you. I can't tell you how sorry I am that it has all worked out this way, especially since you've been so helpful and patient right from the beginning. I'm enclosing under separate cover a box of Hershey bars with almonds, a tortilla press, and a manuscript of my newest book entitled How to Survive on an Alien Planet. According to impartial readers, this is a well-researched and hiply written examination of problems very similar to yours and contains many practical hints and suggestions. Stay well, old buddy. Keep the old flag flying and all that sort of thing. If anything turns up, I'll act immediately. But you really shouldn't count on it. All the best, the author. What, what a way to end a book. I mean, okay, there is a coda. A, well, a couple of coders, actually. There, there's part of me that wishes it ended there. Yeah, me too. <laughs> because the first coder, Final Transformation, I mean, I, I won't read it out. It's very similar to, in some ways, it's similar to the climax of the condition of Muzak. Well, it, in my head, I, it gives you two options, right? It yeah. gives you the, the St. Elsewhere ending, or it gives yeah. you the um, Jacob's Ladder ending. And it's like, yeah. your choice <laughs> as, yeah, to, yeah. as to what created this. Um, yeah. Which I think it's funny that it gives you both options. And I think what this was written in 75. So yeah. I don't know. I don't know how common that like trope was then f for yeah. the story to end like that. Yeah. But yeah. I do think it's funny that both exist. <laughs> both of those stereotypical like cop out endings of fantastical tales yeah. are put at the end of this. It's funny. Because the book is called Options. <laughs> Correct. And at the end of the day, but there's also that final bit as well where it says the man of a thousand disguises turned into Mishkin, the robot turns it changes into Uncle Arnold, etc. 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 And it says, Final exhibit a photograph of the second battalion of the third infantry regiment, seventh division, eighth army. It's a long photograph, a scroll, a souvenir. Unroll it carefully. How much alike the faces are. But look, Mishkin is in the fourth row from the bottom, third face from the left. He has a silly smirk on his face, he is in no way remarkable. I think Sheck was probably referring to himself there because he did serve in the 8th Army in Korea in the 40s, I think before the Korean War started. So post-World War II, he was, I think he was conscripted and, and actually served in the Army of Korea. So there's a final little suggestion there as well that, you know, Mishkin is just an avatar of himself, which is, you know, fair enough. I think authors often use their protagonists as their own personal avatars, don't they? But yeah. So that was options. What do you reckon? What a ride! Yeah, I, I I liked it quite a bit. Um, it, you know, it's funny. I I would like to read some more by him, but even this book was very hard to find in the United States. Which I mm. you had to send me this copy. Um, yeah, which I appreciate. But uh, mm. I don't know. I, I well, haven't looked into whether or not other books of his are as difficult to track down over here. But 
Yeah, I, I would definitely strongly recommend if you want to check out more Sheckley that's not quite as uh, challenging narrative-wise, mm -hmm. but still is packed with those kind of ideas and ways to kind of deconstruct some of the tropes of the form of science fiction from the 50s and 60s and maybe the 70s. Probably the 50s and 60s, actually, because I think they were both written in the 60s. Uh, the State of Civilization is fantastic, and Dimension of Miracles is fantastic. And back in the day when I was a stoner, I used to lend Dimension of Miracles to people, to my mates, and insist they read it, and they would all be like, whoa. One of those, like, hell yeah, read this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's one of those, they were all like, that was amazing. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I definitely recommend um, Dimension of Miracles and the State of Civilization. It turned out, I actually ended up having two copies of options. The Pan book, which is the one that we've been reading from, mm -hmm. with that like sort of fantastical, you know, almost like Monster Zero, um, King Ghidorah monster on the cover with the robot. And um, I've got another one up on the shelf behind me, which I'll probably send out to a patron. I'm going to keep hold of this one because it's very dear to me. Um, but have, have you ever read anything else like this, edited by any other authors who kind of approach this level of unconventionality in sf and genre fiction uh not narrative wise i think i think the the not in the presentation but the, the themes touched on it um remind me a lot of what i like about um i think where alistair reynolds will take some of his stories that you have recommended of... alistair reynolds to me before and i keep i've got a couple on my shelf on my to read pile that i really need to get to yeah just super you know could be interpreted as, as like too heady but like philosophical questions of what you're giving to reality and your existence and, and what the universe gives back sort of mm -hmm. ideas. And I think this book really, it does explore that a lot towards mm -hmm. the end, <clears throat> which is mm -hmm. what I think as, as the last maybe 50 pages sort of feel like they spiral more and more out of control. If you're reading it, it really, that's what I think pulls the whole thing together to me that all that questioning, all that give and take of space time. I mean, they, they mentioned the, <laughs> where your place is in space time quite a bit in this and we didn't even talk about yeah. that um but i think you know, it just speaks a lot to me i love i love thinking about those sort of things so mm. this explores yeah. them well I, I think in terms of authors you know modern authors that maybe come close i think probably i'd possibly nominate steve ale at, um i say modern i think i probably read his book lint which is a book about a science fiction author uh, probably 20 years ago, which I highly recommend, Lint by Steve Aylett. Um But also, he, as well as various other things, including a, I suppose you could describe it as absurdist, like a, a, a series of comic strips called Hyperthick. Uh, but also, he wrote a Moorcock approved Dances at the End of Time novella as well, which is well, which is, um, which you can get hold of, is well worth checking out too. But I probably struggle to think of any others. So, listeners, answers on a postcard. If this conversation rang any bells with you about other authors who have been producing this kind of, you know, deconstructionist, self-analyzing, you know, meta science fiction narratives, yeah, I'd be very interested to find out a little bit more. Mm. But yeah, options, most enjoyable. And for the second time running, a book that I've really, really enjoyed to a huge degree so yeah great stuff Sorry, it definitely seems like a book worth reading multiple times as well like, yeah yeah i, I had only finished it i like was trying to finish it before we started recording so i like read half of it a little while ago and i finished it uh just yesterday but i definitely already want to just read it again yeah. you know it's it's not yeah, a very I, long book it's just no it's kind of it reads quickly as well as it's only a little over 100 pages and there's so many like breaks it's really like yeah. Book wise, it's probably only like ninety pages of reading, you know. Like, yeah, there's a lot of white space. Yeah, isn't yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I I finished it. I think I read the last third uh, this afternoon. Yeah, uh, just to get it all done because, as I say, I hadn't read it for over thirty years. It was a real, really pleasant surprise, just yeah. like everything else was. Yeah. So, yeah, it was options. So, what else are you up to? What have you got coming up? Um, I have a couple album. Well, I had released um an album called Errant within the last year. I don't. Mm -hmm. my memory fails me as to when I, I kind of put out too much music but uh that's because <laughs> that's you getting a, fucking produce so much yeah, yeah. I know. but that's getting a physical release soon that's oh, coming out nice. in um i think march it's coming out on tape mm. through uh the voices of anger label oh cool so they're putting Send out me links and i'll stick them in the show notes yeah i don't think I, th I don't think he announced it yet but by the time this comes out it will probably have been announced if not then mm. then there it is and then i have yeah. another album coming out in april 
Um, that's going to be a like doom metal focused album. Um, yeah. Which I've sort of always played around with like the doom style. This is the, a full on like every song has guitar. I try to like focus in on it, keep the same instrumentation. It's just like, you know, choir, guitar, bass, drum, mm. try to make it feel like it was a band. Mm. Um, so that should be fun. That's going to come out on uh, Owl Ripper. Is going to put that out. It's a cool label. There's a lot of noise, a lot of experimental yeah. stuff, some some grindcore. Um, but it's cool that a couple of labels are have been interested in putting out some of our music after all this. Yeah, fantastic. Time. So that's nice. And then yeah. I have I have merch. I have errant merch <laughs> that's up now. Uh, mm. A long sleeve that I think is cool. You can pick it up. Yeah. All right, great. Well, we'll stick links to all that in the show notes. Yep. And uh, direct people to your wares as ever. Well, you know what? I look forward to listening to all that. And thanks as ever for coming by Derry and Tom's once more to talk about another book that I chose. At some point, we're going to have to do something of your choosing. Yeah. So, so get, I want to go back and cap on. I, well, I think when we had, were discussing this, uh, my choices are, they, they remain. I'd like to do Childhood's End or um, The Moat in the Eye of God. Of course. Yeah. yeah, yeah. M- Moat in God's Eye. Moat in God's is, Eye. I always say, that. You can see my Larry Nivens oh, yeah, just yeah. over my <laughs> left shoulder behind the cassettes. Uh-huh. So yeah, I've uh, I've got. Pl- you know what? It's been a while since I read the Moat in God's Eye and the Moat Around Merchantson's Eye as well. I mean, one thing about the Moat in God's Eye, it's a much chunkier book than yeah. we're used to doing on this podcast. So maybe that's maybe that's a challenge I need to step <laughs> up to. Yeah. All right. Cool. Well, yeah, we'll definitely <laughs> right. get that in the calendar for later this year. All right, sounds good. All right. Cheers, mate. Great to see you again. Thanks. Massive thanks to Derek for returning to Derry and Tom's once more. You can find all of Derek's music at imria.bandcamp.com and stay tuned at the end of my waffling to hear the title track from his recent album, Errant. I say recent rather than latest because... As is his want, he's added another six releases to his discography since then. You can also find his merch on there too, and that includes CDs, art prints, t-shirts and hoodies. And as if that's not enough, his entire discography is currently up for grabs for a shared over $6, which is an absolute bargain. And thanks as always to our patrons for keeping this show on the road. First, those without tear. Anthony Paconti, Tim Cardos, Dave Dempster and Sebastian Weetabix. And our chaos engineers, Andrew Cicluna, Andrew Spong, Andrew Van Ness, Anthony Porter, Benjamin Fletcher, Brandon Mays, Dave Griffiths, Dave Voxman, Gabriel Laycock, Harvey Faulkner Aston, Jim Kirkland, Jim Knight, Jim Jupp, John W. Lays, Jules Lawrence, Mal Pertwee, Mary Catherine, Matt Saltz, Nelbert, Ofa Ziv, Paul McRandall, PJ Cooper, Scott Butler, and Simon Perrins. And to our crafty jugaderos, Alexander Harris, Christian Hundal, Eliel Westenra, Laws, Taylor, Matthew Broom, Graham Holden, Toby White, and, new to the Donblas, Thanasis Beltios, fresh from the Isle of the Purple Towns. An eternal thanks to our patron demons, Alistair Davison, Andy Clark, Andy Darby, David Lee, Fred Keish, Gareth Wilson, Glenn Sawyer, Greg Faulkner, Gwen Barlow, Ian Stead, Imria, Jenny Stim, Jason Vogel, Jay Risa, Joe Monty, Lee Gary, Mark Hebden, Marius Latowskis, Miles Reed Lobato, Neil Burton, Paul Hillary, Randall Gatlin, Steve Round, Tom Murphy, Tony Malazzo, the OG patron Norman Beresford, and last, but never least, Robert McMillan. Enough from me. Don't forget you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram with the handle at Breakfast Ruins. You can email us at breakfastruins at outlook.com. The webpage is breakfastintheruins.com. BIT at Breakfast in the Ruins Radio is live on Radio Garden or via the web player at Breakfast in the Ruins Radio.blogspot.com. We have our Patreon page too, and there are a few extra odds and sods on there. But for now, take care, stay safe, and we will meet again soon on the Moonbeam Rods. Oh.